Welcome to this talk of the CVPR workshop on neuromorphic computing hardware and event-based vision. Is it a perfect match? My name is Julia Sandamirska. I'm a researcher with the Neuromorphic Computing Lab at Intel. Throughout this workshop, you must have heard several brilliant talks on event-based sensors, event-based vision algorithms, and neuromorphic computing hardware. So we must be on the same page here. What I would like to explore and discuss in this talk is the question of what would it take to make neuromorphic hardware bring event-based vision on the next level, next level of performance, low latency, low power consumption, why solving really difficult real-world tasks? Let's start this journey. So as you might have seen in the, in the workshop, there are different types of neuromorphic hardware out there. There are different designs that have been developed by academic labs, industrial labs, and startups. And different technology is used to realize what people call neuromorphic devices. Uh, we at Intel use digital CMOS to develop our neuromorphic research chip. Some labs use mixed signal CMOS with analog and digital electronics um, used to implement spiking neuronal dynamics. And, and some people explore new materials such as memoristic devices or spintronic devices to build neuromorphic devices. So in the end, neuromorphic hardware looks very differently and very different technologies used to implement it. So what is in common in all these devices? How shall we define neuromorphic hardware? So for this talk, I would like to highlight three main features of neuromorphic computing hardware. The first is the neuronal model. So we all know that neuromorphic hardware implements spiking neuronal networks on chip. What does it mean? Spiking um, neuron, I would highlight two characteristics there. The first is the temporal character of processing. So the internal variable, the value, the activation value of a neuron is not just a number. It's a number that evolves over time. So it has some temporal dynamics. Usually it's a simple uh, leakage or decay of activation variable, but could also be something more complex. Um, the second temporal component is on the input side. The synapse um, is also not just a static weight. It can have some temporal uh, dynamics and temporal filtering. Usually, again, just some, some exponential decay, but also could encode some temporal kernel. The second characteristic of spiking neurons is that um, they communicate their activation to each other with spikes, with discrete binary events um, that signal that the internal variable has reached the predefined threshold. So these two uh, properties describe spiking neuron. Um, what does it mean to have a spiking neuron? First, time is explicitly included in computation. So it's really a temporal machine. Um, and events or spike transmit activation. And by doing that, they define special temporal patterns as the ones that encode information in, in this um, setup. It's not just values. Um, it's not some functions. This is a special temporal patterns. The second characteristic a feature of neuromorphic computing technology is topology of the neuronal network that you design and use. We are all very familiar with deep neuronal network, convolutional neuronal networks that have a certain layered structure and usually feed forward um, flow of, of activation. Um, in neuromorphic hardware, we are free to design networks uh, in with, with whichever topology we want. It can be recurrent networks, it can be networks with several inputs and several outputs, it can be networks in which we create some densely interconnected um, you no know, small world network, and, and then we connect these densely interconnected modules more sparsely. So um, this technology opens up a whole space of algorithms that we can implement with neurons and connections between them. And the final um, characteristic property is, of course, learning. How do we learn in these networks? And here, neuromorphic technology follows the biological inspiration. In biology, it seems that the synapses, the connections between neurons, they change all the time. Luckily, even when we are grown-ups, they constantly change. Um, but this change is local. It means that the synapse is only informed about activity of the pre- and postsynaptic neuron. Um, and not other synapses in the network or activity in some neuron far away. Um, usually, the uh, rule according to which the synapse changes its value are called plasticity rules. The typical plasticity rule is STDP, spike time dependent plasticity, where the sign and the magnitude of change of the weight depends on the order in which the pre and postsynaptic spikes arrive at the synapse. Um, 
there are many different plasticity rules ha that have been found in biology and are also implemented in neuromorphic hardware. Uh, but the uniting characteristics of these learning rules are usually local. They're really localized to two neurons that are connected by synapse. So in the case of Loihi, um, how did we put these principles in, in hardware? So Loihi consists of 128 neuronal cores each core can simulate of up to 1,000 neurons, and um, overall, the Ichi chip has 128 million synapses with an advanced spiking neuronal network feature set. What does it mean? It means that all those parameters of the leaky, integrate, and fire neuronal model can be chosen by the user on chip, as well as parameters of the synapse. If you remember those temporal kernels, we can set them up. So there's a handful of parameters that help us to set up a particular network. Uh, Loihi supports highly complex neuronal network topologies, uh, and, and this is this feature that we can wire up whichever networks we want, whichever you know, neuromorphic algorithms that, that we want. We are not bound to feedforward networks only, or you know, convolutional networks having certain structure. Scalable on-chip learning capability. Um, this is the this local learning rule. Because the learning rule is local, we can have it active all over the chip. It will still run in parallel, run very efficiently, because we don't need to communicate far away those uh, learning events. Um, the chip is fully digital and asynchronous, implemented in Intel's um, 14 nanometer technology. So now if we look um, at the chip, we can see that it has this parallel input-output port so that we can create larger systems, tiling chips um, to each other. We can also direct input and read out uh, from the chip efficiently in real time. That's important for our applications, in particular in event-based vision. And we also have a possibility to have some code running um, on the same die that, that is not neuro neuromorphic. So we have a conventional x86 coprocessors that can do some job, maybe on, on input-output, maybe doing some computation that doesn't fit this neuromorphic paradigm. At Intel, we have different form factors in which one can try out Loihi. The smallest one is the USB stick uh, device called Kapoho Bay. It contains two Loihi chips, which is 200,000 spiking neurons, and it features a, an address event representation interface that allows us to connect it directly to one of the dynamic vision sensors. Um, the second in size form factor is Nahuku board. It has 32 chips. Um, and it's integrated with the Area 10 FPGA so that one can have some, some, some heavy massively parallel processing of it before it comes to the neuronal cores or after. Um, and then finally, we have Pahoiki Sprint. This is the largest system that we currently have. It has 768 chips or 1 million neurons. So now the question of um, our talk. So how can we uh, bring event-based vision of, of which I guess you already know uh, enough, and the spiking neuronal networks, right? That have this particular funny dynamics and, and exchange of, uh, of spikes. And then the big question behind is, how do we program spiking neuronal networks on chip to solve different useful vision tasks? And then here is the list of methods, right? We can do deep learning, and, and I will show a couple of examples of how that can be done. We can do deep learning in conventional non-spiking domain. We can do deep learning in spiking domain. We can design uh, spiking neuronal network versions of conventional algorithms, um, con conventional computer vision algorithms, or other statistical learning algorithms other than deep learning with its gradient descent. Um, and then these um, um, algorithms, they can be some you know, older pre-deep learning algorithms, or can also be something completely new that we didn't think about when we were bound to conventional computing architecture. Now with this new computing substrate, we could come up with some completely novel algorithms. We could also perform direct network structure search, for instance, using evolutionary optimization or some other you know, search in this space of structure of the networks. And then there are some examples of successful um, architectures found with evolutionary search, even presented in this workshop. Or we can get inspired by biology. In, in neuroscience, in the end, in the, um, today, we, we have a lot of knowledge of different circuits in the brain, in brains of different animals, not insects or mammals, that solve different tasks. And sometimes there are hypotheses of very precise structure of those neuronal circuits that seems to be responsible for a particular task. And we could get inspired and could have something similar on chip. So let's now zoom in on different, these different methods and just talk about a couple of examples, um, how that can be, has, has been done on Loihi. So the first is, of course, deep learning. When we have, when you hear a neuronal network today, you immediately associate it with deep learning because deep learning allow you to build and train powerful neuronal networks. 
So when we want to run a deep network on Loihi, there are three approaches that we could take. The first one, if I have some standard training data set, images or um, you know some other data that is not spiking a priori. And I know that the particular deep neural network structure solved this problem well. I train this network with backpropagation, I translate it into a spiking version, and I can map it onto Loihi chip. Usually when we do that, we express activations of neurons with firing rates. So at higher rate, higher value, lower rate, lower value. And I will comment on that representation, which tends to be not the most efficient one for neuromorphic hardware. Now, the second approach is if I, for instance, already have an event-based data set. Now, I have my event-based camera, I, I have events, um, so, so I have the spike-based structure of my data, then I can also train a spiky neural network directly with um, uh, a proxy of backpropagation with some similar algorithm to back backpropagation, I can get a spike in neural network that will solve my event-based task. I can again map that network on Loihi and, and get you know, certain results. I will, I will show you what kind of results you can get. Here, the information will be encoded in special temporal spike timing patterns. So here information is not anymore encoded in rate of firing of individual neurons, but it's the, um, the temporal pattern of spikes across neurons that encodes your information. Um, and, and finally, you could have some pre-trained network with either of the two methods. You translate it on Loihi, but you leave some space for on-chip online learning. And there are different methods that uh, do that in a systematic, um, kind of mathematical, um, well-analyzed way that shows you that with a certain learning rule, you will get certain convergence properties in, and we call it online learning. So a couple examples there, they are well known by now. The first one um, is um, Slayer. This is a method how to train spiking neural network with surrogate gradients. Um, and the first example where that has been used uh, was applied to a DVS gesture data set, where a set of you know, up to 10 uh, gestures are learned, trained by a network with um, six layers um, with Slayer. And, and here, each gesture is a particular sequence of events that happens over the space of the image. Um, the final implementation is very you know, energy efficient, only 336 milliwatt of uh, you know, power on Loihi, and dynamic power is even less and less than 10 millisecond latency. Um, and the thorough study has been done, so this layer um, is definitely one of the methods that one can use to create networks that solve tasks um, in the event-based vision domain. Um, there has been some work in our Intel neuromorphic research community that combines event-based vision sensing with tactile sensing. Um, and by having two networks that solve uh, the visual and the tactile tasks, we then uh, can then combine them um, with the learning on chip. So we can have some associative learning on, on chip that allows us to enable multimodal perception. Next thing that one has done um, on chip is to take pre-trained um, relatively deep neural network that solves the gesture recognition task, just the same one as before with the same data set, um, and then introduce an additional readout head of this network that is trained on chip on the fly to learn new gestures. Of course, the assumption here is that, that this um, output representation of the pre-trained network is close enough to something that you can learn, some, you know, the, the space of the new gestures that you can learn with the system. But this has shown um, quite good results as well. And, and there was a paper last year that, that shows how you can use this on-chip online learning to perform continual learning uh, with one of the famous methods when you just learn new readouts on chip. Now, is deep learning the only way how you can do image classification and how you can solve visual tasks on, on Loihi? Um, certainly not. So this is an example. It um, has not uh, yet been applied to event-based sensing, but it could. Um, and this is where uh, we solve the task of pattern matching. And you might be familiar with this task if you uh, are working in, in, in SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping in robotics. There is the task of loop closure, which requires place recognition. So when I revisit certain place, I, I see certain view, I want to find a similar place among the memories of the previous places. Um, so what, what has been done also on, on Loihi, on our large scale Pahoiki Springs system, is um, demonstrated one-shot learning and recognition with k-nearest neighbor search. Um, so 
how this work happens. So here we have images. As the first step, we encode these images with sparse coding. So we have some compact representation of, of the image. Um, and then in, in the second step, we furthermore uh, represent um, this you know, vector of the image as a um, spike train pattern. So special temporal um, pattern of spikes. So you know that you have different different filters and different filter maps, and now the value of each filter will be encoded in the timing of a particular neuron, timing of spike of a particular neuron. So this is just a very compact representation of our patterns, which we can now store uh, in in several subnetworks on on Loihi, and we can store many such such patterns on Loihi, so that then when I present the query image, which will be also pre-processed in the same way, um, I will immediately, in massively parallel way, distribute this query, query image into all the memory, memory stored on chip, and will immediately get um, as an answer you know, the best match, and then I could query for the second best match, um, and as many matches as I need to solve my, my task. Um, so the, um, the benchmarking result of this uh, network has just shown now it works fast. So the query latency in milliseconds is around three for Pahoiki sprints, while it takes uh, much longer in most cases um, with other algorithms, with the exception of, of this um, method, um, which also has you know, higher throughput, although ours you know, is just the next one, and, and the other methods are much, much, uh, have much lower throughput. And, and the, um, uh, the caveat by, by this method is that it requires a lot of time to build the index that then later allows one to find um, an image. And also the size of the system um, that, that holds this um, image is much, much larger. So on, on this task, Pahoiki Sprint seems to outperform uh, all other conventional methods. And one can see how a similar method could be used for, for instance, event-based place recognition. Now when we are talking about one-shot fast continual learning, this is of course a fascinating topic and very important for robotics. Uh, in robotics, it has been shown that um, if you have a network that was pre-trained on the best and largest data set ever, now you apply it to an object, similar objects that have been part of the data set. But these objects are now, you know, they are seen with a particular camera, with particular optical parameters. It can be seen under different viewing angles. It has been shown that performance of pre-trained networks, as large and big as, as they can be, drops dramatically under this setting. Um, so this concept of, you know, training and deep, deep network for, for robotics has, has caveats. Um, so we have studied um, this continual learning in robotics um, question and problem. Um, and we have figured out that for, for robotics, the task of image classification is not obligatory the task we want to, to solve. Um, in robotics, it's rather about um, object instance classification. I want to recognize you know, a particular cup or a particular book or you know, a particular um, product that I need to, to, to work with. But I want to recognize this instance from different orientations and from different views. Um, so it's really about multi-view representation for uh, maybe even low number of objects. Um, and we want to learn these objects quickly and an interaction with the user. The user shows an object, the, the robot forms some kind of representation and, and can then build up this representation, um, can add new objects. Um, so you can imagine this process of um, you know, slowly growing the representation, forgetting if something, um, you know, uh, is not needed anymore, um, kind of separating different clusters um, on the fly. Um, and you can imagine how these asynchronous processing in your Morphic hardware with its online on-chip learning capability is well suited for these type of tasks. Um, so we have started working in, in this direction. We work with the um, ICAP robot simulator um, that has um, event-based camera simulator integrated into its eyes. We render 3D objects into the scene and, and we look at them with the robot at the different poses. Now, the object are static in this scenario. They are on the table, the robot is standing in front of the table. So in order to generate events uh, with the robot, we use microsaccadic eye movements, you know, this small, um, movements of, of the camera that are similar to micro saccadic eye movements in humans that, that people even think play a role in feature extraction and visual processing. Here we don't really make uh, use of them, but we just use them to generate events, just as many events as we need to solve the task. This is the example of the output of this camera. So you know, in, in the full view, the object is this little uh, tiny blob. Uh, we 
overlay these, um, this processing with some attention mechanism that will help us to zoom in on the object approximately. It doesn't need to be perfect segmentation, um, but we want to cut out a smaller window out of the full um, space of the field of view, just to keep our network small so that it can run quickly and, and it can also learn quickly. Um, so the network that we um, train for classifying these objects is very simple and, and, and not very deep. It has four layers. Uh, it has fixed uh, filters, very simple, Gabor filters, horizontal, vertical, and, and oblique with 45 degrees. It has some downpooling, quite uh, drastical downpooling. So at the end, we have um, 13 times 13 um, neurons feature maps, four feature maps. And, and now the... Um, the part that makes it network interesting is this, what we call neuronal learning control and state machine. Um, it's a circuit of neurons that are interconnected in order to enable autonomous learning in this task. And what do I mean by autonomous learning? Um, so we have a neuron that would detect that a visual pattern is presented on the input, but the network hasn't produced any output. Um, it means, no, I cannot recognize an object. I might want to learn it. I might ask the user for a label. Um, I have another uh, neuron that signals, um, I have seen this label before. I must have already a representation for this object, but it's not enough to recognize it. Um, maybe it's some other view of the object. So I will uh, recruit a new uh, local view neuron that will learn a new representation of the object. For each local view, the representation that's stored in plastic synapses on chip is very simple. These are simply the weight matrices that go to those different uh, um, feature maps you know, on chip. And, and they are uh, learned and updated as long as the view is similar to the previous, previously seen one. And as soon as the view is very different, you know, I see object from a completely different view, there's no overlap whatsoever with the learned weight matrix, then I will spend a new neuron um, and, and learn new visual pattern for this particular object. So we have a whole, um, we call it neuronal state machine that orchestrates the work of this network and allows us to learn these objects in an interactive scenario with the user. I have a couple of results that I just flash here. This is just about to be to be published, um, not yet published work. But uh, what we show there is, for instance, that this mechanism with the automatic allocation of different neurons for different objects, um, it automatically allocates you no know, fewer neuron, like one neuron, for objects that are uh, rotationally symmetric, like you know, like orange or Rubik cubes or bowl. They just get only one pose neuron, and that's enough to learn the representation of this object in a single plastic layer. And for some other objects like scissors or wrench or you know, screwdriver, they look very differently under different viewing angles. So for them, we have more neurons up to eight, which was a maximum here. Um, and we can see that these number of neurons also correlates with um, you know, just the kind of similarity between poses for different objects. So some objects, they are very similar. They are eight different poses. And for others, their eight different poses are completely different. Um, and it's just important to, to keep that in mind when we want to recognize objects in a robotic setting. Um, here we just demonstrate that this uh, learning process is truly continual uh, because every representation um, for every object is uh, independent of each other, it's separate. And we have this mechanism to um, switch on different output neurons. Um, we can present objects in whichever order. I can present an apple 10 times and then I present you know, a cup and, and then a book for 20 times. It doesn't really matter. We don't suffer from catastrophic forgetting here um, as much as other networks. And the network you know, automatically you know, requests label when they are needed and detects errors automatically. And over the learning trials, um, slowly but steadily, there are almost no errors made. There's still, so these are the confusion matrices and different points in time over this learning process. And, and we can see that over learning, there are fewer and fewer confusions. Um, there are overall not very um, many confusions taken into account that our representation of so this second to last layer before learning synapses is really quite poor. It's a tiny image with 13 times 13 uh, feature maps, just um, eight Gabors. I, I wouldn't expect much from this representation. So this is actually quite an impressive result for um, keeping apart eight objects under eight different poses with the setup. And we just show that, yes, for this representation, we do as well or better than other you know, continual learning, just statistical learning approaches, you know, perceptrons, stochastic gradient descent, or passive aggressive method. And the only method that um, converges faster um, is um, naive bias, multi, uh, multinomial distribution, which is, however, computationally much more um, evolved. 
Now, of course, this object learning and recognition is now only part of the larger system. And in collaboration with Chiara Bortolozzi, we have set up um, a demo. So that's also not yet the published work, um, but we set up a system that puts this object learning um, network in the context of overall behavior of a robot like that. So in order to enable that on, on chip, so we need to create little state machines again that control whether the robot should now look for a new object, uh, trigger attentional module, select interesting places to look at, focus on one of these places, you know, take the small region of interest, try to recognize an object, maybe not recognize it, then try to learn it, ask for a label, learn it, um, and then move on to the next object. So there's a whole behavioral organization system that builds a scene representation um, of objects and their spatial locations. And for spatial, spatial locations, we have a module that is similar to SLAM. It's simultaneous localization and mapping. It's just not localizing, you know, vehicle in an environment it's localizing objects um, in an environment in front of the robot relative to to this robot you know, moving around moving its head um, and then uh, so we also link you know the behavior to actual motor commands um, and and these two modules they also can be you know extended like slam there's a whole uh, number of works in our intel's neuromorphic research community that study neuromorphic uh, realizations of uh, simultaneous localization and method uh, and and mapping methods mainly inspired by famous red slam model from michael milford um, which in its turn is inspired by biological findings of circuits that seem to control navigation behavior in in animals rats and mice um, so people have found you no know, head direction cells and have hypothesized what kind of circuit what kind of network could solve this task of this um, odometry in in uh, orientation um, the same for you know odometry in, in moving around famous play cells uh, grid cells play a special role in navigation they seem to be responsible for path integration um, in this network um, then we have local view cells so those would be those place recognition cells that can recognize different places and, and learn associations between those recognized places and locations and by that building a map um, and then we have also error monitoring and correction circuit that is active during loop closure event. When I have detect that I have visited this place before and I encounter some error, then I can act on this error. I can either update my internal model, uh, my path integration model, or I can update the map. So as you see, there are you know, many, many circuits that are um, mostly designed and the design is taken from, from biological neural networks or from first principles. So we want to compute an error. How can we do it with the uh, spike in neurons? Um, so this work has been done uh, in collaboration with the Institute of Neuroinformatics in Zurich. There's also work in the lab of uh, Konstantinos Michmizos, who studied neuromorphic SLAM and has shown that it performs the close to optimal Bayesian integration of new information and stored information. And on chip, he observes um, huge power benefits compared to an equivalent network running on a CPU. Um, so that was SLAM. And now the, the final component that we had in this overall system was motor control. Um, so we have studied for quite some time now how um, vision and motor control can be put together in neuromorphic hardware. And we have studied with this, with this early work that uh, was not using LOIHI at that time. It was using mixed signal electronic devices, really tiny, tiny chip. Um, and we have designed a tiny, tiny network that can do an you know, obstacle avoidance target acquisition, like a little Breitenbeck vehicle uh, that receives the almost raw events from event-based sensor, and then has a little network that can make a decision, is it better to go left or to go right? Um, there's a similar work um, inspired or derived from Toby Delbrook's uh, predator prey work, where he trains a convolutional neural network to detect uh, you know, prey robot in the visual field. And then as an output the network gives you the motor command, go left, right, straight ahead or, or stop. Um, we have also studied behavior of this network as a spiking neural network, receiving directly flow of events instead of accumulated event frames. Um, and then have sh um, shown some interesting properties uh, when you do this translation from convolutional neural network to spiking neural network. And when you change your input from event frames to raw events, 
um, then you need to take into account different temporal character of these events that can come in bursts uh, and have different um, temporal characteristics as a flow of um, information is of events. And your spike in neural network that is sensitive to temporal um, distribution um, of input events in time and, and then spikes in the middle of the network. Um, so you have to tune um, those um, characteristics to your to your input stream and, and input characteristics. So that was quite interesting work. Uh, the most recent incarnation of this work where we do vision driven control um, is one that we've done um, in collaboration with, with the has been done in David uh, um, some time um, ago, where David has demonstrated ultra fast uh, visual um, tracking. Uh, it was tracking sim simple pattern, just the horizon. So basically in event-based sensor, just a camera, but it makes a point that you can track uh, this pattern at speeds that would be unthinkable with conventional sensor. Um, so we wanted to uh, move this work uh, one step further and now implement visual processing on neuromorphic chip and see whether we get advantages. And then we do. So um, with the vision processed on, on chip, we get um, um, even faster um, reaction and ability to track faster moving uh, disks with lower error. So the error, you know, four degrees with uh, up to 1000 uh, degrees per second and, and even, even, even higher. Um, how we have uh, done this is maybe also a nice example of how um, algorithms can be put on neuromorphic hardware to solve visual tasks. Um, so um, Davide uh, uh, has shown how you can do event-based half transform, which is very efficient. Uh, and you can imagine how that is done, right? So each event brings you X and Y of the pixel that has fired, um, and you can translate it into a two-dimensional space of line parameters, where you know each event will correspond to some line. Um, and if you have many events, then you have many of these lines. So what you need to do is to find uh, where they all intersect. Um, and then you can take the, this value, and this will give you the parameters of the line uh, that generated this event in the first place. Um, and if you now take the angle of that line, you can use it for your controller because the controller tries to get rid of the offset. Um, and you need to do it very fast. Now, if you want to solve it on uh, neuromorphic hardware in a spike in neural network, that's a very simple network structure that can do this job for you. Uh, you just take your input space, the X and Y of the frame with events uh, coming in, and, and you connect it to another similar two-dimensional space of your line parameters. And the only uh, magic that you need to do is to encode the half transform in those weights from input space to half space, so that now each event uh, in your input space will create a line in your half space. Um, this is again another visualization of this process. So you have the horizon that you want to track. You track it with dynamic vision sensor. You get events. Now they arrive at the first uh, layer of spike in neurons on Loihi. This green weight, they encode, they half transform so that each event here creates a little line or curve in the half space. And we can set up the dynamics of these neurons in such a way that um, the neuron for which you know, certain number of uh, lines overlaps, and here we will be followed uh, previous work and like eight, 80 lines need to overlap for a neuron to fire. And then this spike can immediately be read out by another population of neurons that encodes the angular offset and that can immediately be used in, in the controller. Um, so just if you're a fan of uh, fancy visualizations, that just shows um, you know, the data re recorded from the experiment. So these are these half-transform lines, and this is the readout, one-dimensional readout of um, the angle. And we can connect it to spiking um, controller, but that's not the topic here. So uh, this is just part of that network. Um, so. As you can see, the neuromorphic hardware has many different applications all over the place. Event-based vision is, of course, one of the first applications one would think of uh, because uh, event-based cameras produce data that matches the um, representation capacity of uh, neuromorphic hardware. There are events in the camera, there are spikes in, in neuromorphic hardware. So the match seems to be nice, but the question remains, what kind of networks shall we implement in neuromorphic hardware in order to solve complex tasks efficiently? And we have recently published a paper in IEEE Proceedings um, that presents results of uh, all the benchmarking studies that have been accomplished in Intel's neuromorphic research community by our partners and collaborators. Um, and this plot um, kind of visualizes it, it, it all. 
So here each dot shows some, some study, some network, some task that has been implemented on Loihi and in some other hardware. Right? So circles are for CPU, diamonds for GPU, triangles for Intel Mavidius, um, compute stick and crosses for IBM's True North architecture. And we compare um, each of these architectures to Loihi and plot energy ratio versus Loihi and solution time ratio versus Loihi. So for Loihi, this corner is good and everything below this line is uh, not to get you better. Um, and we have, you see, distribution. So if we now look closer at this distribution, then in, in this corner, we find all those networks that were trained as a deep neuronal network, as a conventional neuronal network. And then they were translated into spiky neuronal networks with rate, co rate um, coded values. And we see that in some cases you gain you know, something in energy and or solution times. In some cases you don't. Um, so we find these networks are not the most um, prominent and, and the most efficient on Loihi. Um, in, in this corner, we rather find other architectures and other network structures, such as, for instance, the um, K nearest neighbor search or graph search or networks that solve constraint satisfaction problems or lasso problems. Um, we find SLAM here and you know, adaptive arm controller. So these, uh, we say novel compared to you know, deep learning, um, because many of them are actually old um, architectures, implemented as a spiky neural network on this asynchronous hardware with the on-chip online learning can bring you up to you know, 100,000 uh, times uh, advantage in terms of um, energy and 1,000 times faster solution. So that's quite, can be quite impressive if one designs the right algorithms for this hardware and for the task. All right, so there are many challenges that are still on, on the way to this vision where neuromorphic hardware will really help to achieve you no know, orders of magnitude advantage for event-based vision tasks and then also increase their complexity. So some of the challenges um, is the development of those neuromorphic uh, computing hardware compatible vision algorithms. And, and the space of algorithms is vast. There might be some algorithms that we even don't think of uh, yet because we haven't used this type of hardware before. Um, there could be algorithms we could get inspired from biology about. There could be some conventional algorithms that work you know, somehow, not perfectly, but on neuromorphic hardware, they could maybe really fly. Um, and there are, of course, some, you know, pre-trained deep neural networks that could maybe solve some tasks particularly efficiently on Loihi. The second challenge is benchmarks, because very often in those tasks where we see large advantages for Loihi, and robotics would be one such domain, um, there's just not so, so many benchmarks, and it's uh, difficult to benchmark workloads there, because um, robots are very different. Every robot is different. You know, I, even if I take two DVS, I, I mount a different lens on them, and then my images look already completely different, and the data set that has been created by someone might um, not be so easy to use in my setting. Um, so one idea how one could you know, improve these benchmarks, at least in robotic setup, is maybe using robotic simulators um, in order to produce data that will be close to whichever robotic setup I will uh, then have in the, in the physical world, or you know, just agreeing on, on some benchmarks that will um, allow us to also uh, achieve generalization to real world scenarios and tasks and use cases. Um, yeah, so this is of course a big challenge for the whole community, not only our community. And then um, so neuromorphic hardware is a very young hardware compared to conventional hardware, compared to investments that have been done in the last 50, 60, 70 years in conventional hardware. So we are of course lacking all the tools and libraries and um, you know, just the amount of software uh, developed and user interfaces to easily develop and explore algorithms. If it's very difficult to uh, explore this new novel algorithms, then of course I will just go and take something off the shelf that, that is easy to configure. So there's a real challenge to, to overcome, to, to move this field forward. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is that the computing hardware is not set in stone. So don't take today's hardware as you know, the hardware that we now have to work uh, with in event-based neuromorphic visual processing. Not at all. So we want to explore what works well, what doesn't work well, learn from that and improve hardware and to find optimal convergence point, which might not be a single point and hopefully it won't be a single point, but we'll have a whole zoo of different computing devices that are optimized for all the different tasks we need to solve. And if we think about the brain analogy, that's what we have in the brain. The brain has so many different mechanisms and different structures integrated into this amazing system. 
a little advertisement. Um, we, I've mentioned a couple of times the uh, Intel's neuromorphic research community. This is the way how we interact with other labs, academic labs, government labs, industrial labs. Um, we allow uh, researchers to use our neuromorphic chips. We sometimes even uh, can send them hardware devices. We support them in their algorithm and systems development. And, and we try to, to keep the community active, interactive, exchanging ideas, exchanging challenges and solutions. Um, because there's so much to do in, in this field. It's definitely not, not a job for a single group and a simple, especially a single hardware development group. Um, it's very easy to get involved. Just a single email to INRC interest will trigger the process. I thank you very much for, for listening. I think I probably took a bit longer. Um, I'm looking forward to answer your questions at the workshop. Thank you.